Well, uh, Inge Auerbacher, she arrived um, in Norway last Sunday and she came flying in from uh, Frankfurt and we had heard that, well, she wouldn't have a jet lag because she came from Frankfurt. But the, to be true, you had, you had, you know, you had to start three o'clock in the morning to get to the airport That's in true. Frankfurt and no one had planned that. So she really had an, almost a jet lag. And since then you've been like working hard all week, meeting people, school true. pupils, the embassy. But I'm used to it. Yes. <laughs> She has a program like a 34-year-old, but uh, I must admit that, tell everybody that you are born in 1934. Yeah, but I'm not 84 yet. No. <laughs> but anyway, welcome. Uh, it's an honor to have you here, and Thank it's an honor you. for us at the Holocaust Center to have you here today. And on Monday, Inge will come to our center at Big Day and meet three, three school classes. So, but now you are here today. Thank you. Um, could you tell us where do you come from? Well, I come from a little village in southwestern Germany called Kippenheim, near the French-Swiss border, a, a village of about 2,000 people at the foot of the Black Forest with 60 Jewish families, and I was the last Jewish child to be born in that village. So when no one born after you in after 34, I mean? December 31, 1934, correct. Mm. But tell me about the atmosphere of Kippenheim, because this is absolutely south in Germany, close to the French border. What kind of relation was it between, you said it was 60 Jewish families, what kind of relation do you have to the Christian people, to the village? Well, we had a good relationship with the village, but we had our own community as well a little bit isolated. Life was around the synagogue, and I did not have any Christian friends there. Maybe there were none who were my age, but I had only Jewish friends. Um, the next uh, door neighbor around the corner, he, that child was about four years older. Maybe there were not just uh, too many children my age in that village. Um, it, there were always a little small problems. We kind of lived a little bit, I wouldn't say in secret, we lived open, whatever, um, but our life was mostly around our synagogue, our community, because we were the minority and you didn't want to make any waves. That was very important, you wanted to blend in. My father, for instance, was a soldier in World War I. He was wounded quite badly and received the Iron Cross. My parents gave me a very German name, which is really Scandinavian, Inge, which is a man's name here. In New York, I get mail, Mr. Inge Auerbach, and I'm very angry. I said, I'm a woman. <laughs> But and actually, your parents, they were, uh, they were in Germany for, many, for generations. Well, Jews lived in Germany for over a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And we lived in that village for about 200 years, mm -hmm. at least. And your father, he was actually a war hero from First yes, World War. Yes. And he was uh, actually, he had um, severe damage in one of his legs, wasn't it? No, no, arm. Arm. The shoulder. Mm. But he, he, he did work. He was a businessman, Yeah, actually. he had his own business, textile mm -hmm. merchant. Yeah. And you had a nice <coughs> home, a big home. And a it was very you, big home. And you were a lonely child. Yes. How was your childhood? Before child everything started to happen in, say, 38? Well, I didn't spend that much time in my village because my grandparents, my mother's parents, I didn't know my father's, were, lived about 200 kilometers away. And I spent a great deal in that village, which was about 1,000 people, and with at one time, 40% Jewish in that village, they were allowed to live there with a protected le letter from a baron, uh, but they had to live separate street, but eventually they all lived together, and there uh, I had a lot of friends. My grandparents were the last Jewish family living in this little village called Jebenhausen, a tiny village, and I had wonderful friends there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, up to today. 
So actually, when you were a little kid, you actually went very much to your grandparents before a you lot. went to school to Jebenhausen. Yes. Yeah. I didn't go to school in no, Jebenhausen. No, no, no. But before you went to oh, school, yeah, so before. you could stay. Yes, yeah? yes. yes. Yeah. But then comes, uh, and then you have, many times have you been talking about your birthdays. Actually, you are New Year's. Yes. You're bu- you have a f- fabulous date for a birthday for a child. I, it's great, yeah. It's the New Year's Eve. Yeah, Sylvester. Mm. Yes. And when I was born, the doctor, and my mo- uh, I was born in the house, my parents' house, and he said, oh, Mr. Auerbacher, I only have a princess for you. Mm. Here's the princess. But you have been telling about this doctor who received you, yes. because he actually was a Nazi. Yes, the doctor who delivered me, we only had one doctor, and he already belonged to the SS, the stormtroopers, but he still took very good care of his Jewish patients. And later on, he did terrible things, probably euthanasia, killing people with mental, physical difficulties. And he was in jail for many years. And here is the whole situation. You have a choice in life. Either you stay a good person, which he was, or you become a bad person. And he had had to have a conscience. He wasn't told to do all these terrible things, but to increase his career, he went to that side and chose really mm. bad things. Mm. But when he was the only doctor in Kippenheim, he took care of his inhabitants. Yes, everybody. He mm. was good to the Jewish people too. Mm. And there were no hospitals of you born in your parents' bed on New Year's Eve in 1934. That's true. Mm. Yeah. You remember the gifts when you were a child? Yes. For the birthday. Yeah, I, my grandmother gave me a doll. And the doll meant everything to me. Uh, I named her Marlena because my mother loved movie stars. You probably remember the movie star Marlena Dietrich. I'm sure many of you here know her. When I speak with other children, you know, with children in America, wherever I am, they said, who is that? You know, I said something like Britney Spears. <laughs> anyway, um, and my mother loved these movie stars, and I looked at her album. I was two years old, and I said, Mommy, who's that? Well, it was Malena, so my doll became Malena. But later on, I found out I was speaking in German, and my German is still good. And a woman said, she saw a picture, I could do a slide presentation, and she said, you know, that's a famous doll. I said, well, for me, she was famous, the only object that would survive. Uh, all these terrible years, and I gave her to the Holocaust Museum in Washington Mm -hmm. some years ago. But she said that doll was made for the 1936 Olympics, specifically with the name Inga. That was a very popular name at that time. They had a Burble and Erika, and uh, with blue eyes. My doll had blue eyes and blonde hair. I never knew about that. So she was famous for me. Mm. And um, we made a film about her too, the Olympic doll. So if everyone here in this room goes to the Washington DC and goes to the Holocaust Museum, they might see your doll. Well, right now she's very brittle. She's old like me. So we <laughs> have our problems and they're not showing her anymore. They're afraid the lights will kill her. Well, I don't think they would, mm. but they have her and I'm mm. sorry that they're not showing her. They have shown her and mm. so. Right now, maybe they have other things to show. You have to share. Mm. But Inga uh, just a few weeks ago, in this room, we had a commemoration of the, uh, of the pogroms of November 1938, yes. just a few weeks ago. Right. And you remember those days, oh, in yes. November 10th, in your little German town. Yes. How do you remember it? You were a little girl. Your grandparents were visiting you? Yeah, my grandparents were visiting me, and my grandfather, we were a modern Orthodox family. My grandfather went to the synagogue to say his morning prayers. He was arrested and sent to the Dachau concentration camp. All Jewish men from the age of 16 on, boys in other words, and men, in Austria and in Germany were sent to concentration camps. And in our area, it was Dachau, other areas was Buchenwald. And they started to burn our synagogue because most of the synagogues in those two countries were burned to the ground. 
but in our little town, the Christian houses were extremely nearby and they would have gone up in flames, but they desecrated the building very badly and then they threw in stones through the windows to break all the windows, which we had to pay for the damage later on. And um, what did you, your, your uh, father and grandfather, they were taken away, where were you? Well, we were still in the house. You know, I mean, it was glass all over the place. Was stand. We, we didn't even know what was going on because my father was also arrested. And glass all over the floor. And that's why you have the name Kristallnacht because of the glass glittering. And one of the hoodlums looked through the broken window and he said, oh, the chandelier is still hanging. And he threw a rock through the broken window. My mother just pulled me away. And then we were hiding in the backyard shed. I was not even four years old at that time, but I remember very, very clearly. So then you took the chandeliers also and told well, them that? Yes. Mm. yes. And you, ha you hid in the shed? We hid in the backyard. We mm. had a big house with a courtyard, and they were banging on this big door. They didn't come in, but it lasted all day. Then at night, we went to our Jewish neighbors, also where all the windows were broken and the stores were broken into. It was very, very scary. But you were together with your grandmother and Ye mother? Yes, I was together and with my... And the maid, maybe? Yeah. And the maid also. But she ran away mm. when things were getting tough. And okay. you lived in this beautiful house because your father was a textile uh, um, merchant. And, but actually, when he came back from Dachau, he, he sold the house. He chose to sell because well, he couldn't, couldn't run his business. Right. But, well, you lost your business. Mm. And, but we never thought anything would happen. This crazy Hitler, he will go away. I'm a proud German, I have my Iron Cross. So we were a little slow in trying to get out of the country, which was actually France was very nearby, Strasbourg, for instance, or Switzerland, Basel, all this was very near, but the doors to the free world were closing very rapidly. Your parents actually tried to get away and go to yes. the U United States because you had relatives in the States? Either that or Brazil. Brazil, okay. Because he had already two sisters married in Brazil mm. and anywhere who would take us. Um, so we uh, sold the house and moved in with my grandparents uh, with the hope of either going to any country. Mm. Now, we, I think we had a number to go to America but it would have lasted maybe 10 years or something till our number came up, and you had to have somebody to vouch for you because mm. my father needed a higher amount of money to get into the country. It wasn't like today, uh, you, have, you, have to, you cannot uh, ask the government to help you. You have to be by yourself, and he had a disability. He could work, but that was a detriment especially also. Mm. But they didn't succeed to get away. No. But well, you stayed, as uh, you told me the, uh, this earlier this week, that you stayed safe with your grandparents. Yes. How did you feel? You were just a little girl. I mean, were you scared yes. all the time? Or were no. your parents managed to comforting you? Or? In that village, I didn't feel it. I mean, the children played with me. Maybe there were a few who told the children, don't play with that Jew girl. But for the most part, I had a real very short childhood there. I played with all the children. I was a ringleader even. We were singing the Nazi songs of the day. We didn't even know what it was. One was like this. Auf der Heide blüht ein Blümelein und das heißt Erika was very popular at, the, at that time. And I was a ringleader. Mm. I didn't know any better. Mm. But then the real war broke out then in the fall of 39. Did you remember noticing that? Or, I mean, now you know what's happened, but uh, you stayed fairly quiet and safe till 1942. Then yeah, well, things really rapidly changed. Not quite changed. even before that, but no. we knew when, for instance, Russia got into the war, mm -hmm. Germany into Russia, I remember we were on top of a mountain. We had a nice picnic, the Hornstaufen, which is a sort of a molehill, but to us it meant something. And we had a little picnic on top. And when we came down, they said, we are at war with Russia. Mm. 
And that was quite scary. Mm. You felt this scary, or your parents? Well, my parents too, mm. because mm. that made it even harder for us mm. even to think we could get out. Mm. Where you forced, you have brought a few things here. A book we can talk about later, but you, you brought your yellow star. Yes, I did. When did you get your yellow star? In 1941, when I was six years old, I couldn't go to school with the regular Christian children in the town. There was only one school in Stuttgart, and you had to travel there with permission. Eventually, I even did that myself. And then all Jewish people from the age of six on in Austria and in Germany had to wear the yellow star. And you still have it. Yes, I do. I with have your it. mother's needles thread behind. It's, right. it's really moving. And it came on a yellow sheet like this. We had to cut it out and very poor cloth. And my mother put a backing on it that you could even sew it on. And you could still see the threads on it when I was liberated in May, 19, uh, May 8th, 1945, I tore it off and my mother kept the star and you had to wear it over your left heart, Yuda in Hebrew-like letters. When you walked outside, you had to wear that star. And my father told me, when you go on the train, I went eventually all by myself, try to lean against the left window so none of these children, you know, who were on the same, in the same car would yell at me, you dirty Jew, I was as clean as they, that they should not heckle me. And I would, I, I would like to tell you a, a little bit of my first hero in life. You have choices, again, good choices. Some people made good, some made not so good. And I'm sitting there, and a woman, a Christian woman, walks by me, as probably was her stop. She had a little bag of rolls. And in it, you know, just a little paper bag, probably her lunch. And she walked by me, and as she walked by, she put that little bag next to me and walked out. She saw who I was. And I never forgot this good Christian woman who I never knew, her, I never knew her name. She, did, she wanted to do something for this little Jewish girl. And wherever I speak, whether it's New Zealand, Mexico, I talk about this anonymous woman. She chose to help. And perhaps if more people would have chosen that, it was just a small act for her, but she could have gotten killed for that too. Maybe this tragedy wouldn't have happened. Mm. She was my first hero in life. Mm. And so later on you had other heroes. But then actually life changed because in the fall of 1942, you were deported with your parents. Right. How did you, how if you go back as a girl, what, what really happened to your family that day? Well, we were actually in some other transport. There was one before to Riga, where my grandmother was sent, and in my home state, in the state of Baden, all the Jews from that whole state were deported to a camp in France on the uh, uh, Spanish border and, and near the Pyrenees, and we would have been deported even at that time, but we were not living there anymore. How did I feel? Well, um, we, out of that transport to Riga, we uh, got out because of my father's disability. It was just pure luck. But when August came of 42, um, you couldn't do anything. We got the order for transport. Don't bring any doctor's note. It will not help. Pack uh, up a suitcase. Uh, metal dishes, a blanket, duffel bag, and we were herded into a school gymnasium to get people 50 here in this town, 100 there, to make a transport of close to 1,200 people, and I was the youngest in that transport. I was seven years old, and we were uh, in the Stuttgart in two large halls on the floor, no bed, nothing, waiting for the train. 
But before that, they, um, put, uh, they told us to open everything and they noticed I had a little Dutch boy pin, a wooden pin, and they tore it off me, yelling, do post this network, do engage in, in the Swabian language. Maybe they had a niece, a daughter who, wa who wanted it. I was nothing for them. Then I, they saw I had my doll in my arm. They took her from me and they looked inside a hollow body if I was hiding anything and I wasn't, and I was not going to let my do doll be taken away. Hmm. I made a fuss and that's why I still had her, which <laughs> meant everything to me, to have something from home. And you objected, you good. protested. I did protest, yes, mm. absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And, and, you kept, and you kept your ball. And then you should first you had to Riga and then there was another transport going to Teresin. Yeah, well in Riga, where my grandmother was sent, the school closed actually, the Jewish school, every, all the children had to go to one school in Stuttgart for the whole state after six months. So I never completed my first grade. And those people were sent to the forest, in the Birkenike forest, and shot in the mass mm. graves. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I visited that place mm. a few years ago. I wanted to say goodbye to my grandmother and all my friends who were killed. And you come into a beautiful forest. The birds are chirping, and there's a field there with jagged stones and plates on the ground, where they came from, from Stuttgart, was right in the beginning, Berlin, Hamburg, wherever they came from. But they told me, your grandma isn't there, you have to walk up the hill. There were 52 mass graves, and I walked past about two, and then I had enough. Mm. Over 50,000 people were shot in those mass graves, and that was just one forest, there were many, many. And I wrote a note to my grandmother. I made a copy of the German version of my book, I'm a Star. And I wrote her a note. Liebe Oma, ich werde dich nie vergessen. Dearest Granny, I shall never forget you. And I wrote it in German because I felt if she looks down from above, she doesn't know English. <laughs> you know how you think. And you know her only grandchild. And I put a candle on it. And that was goodbye. When was this? You went back to Few Riga? A few years ago. A few years ago. Yes. That was the first time you went to Riga. Oh, yes. And you I lost many relatives. Before. I lost at least 13 immediate relatives. Certainly my grandmother, mm. uh, aunts, uncles, cousins, 20 altogether, little more distant relatives. In fact, when you go to the synagogue in Kippenheim, the former synagogue, it's been rebuilt. It's a cultural house now. And there's a plaque outside with all the names of the people who were killed, and you will see my family had the most, the Auerbacher family. Mm. Mm. But you are here, so you had luck with your parents. Yes, and the, you can't think of anything but luck. Mm. No. Because you can't describe, you couldn't do anything. Mm. You were sent to Teresin in Czechia. In yes. Norway we say Theresienstadt, yes. but you say Teresin. Well, it's Czech. It's How easier you to say it in Terrace and then mm. such a long word. Mm. But tell me, uh, how do you remember coming there? How do you, when you came there, the buildings, oh. it was huge. Yeah, it, it's a fortress. Cra all crowded with people. I mean, it was really full of people. Full, I mean, wall to wall. It was actually an army garrison town uh, built by Emperor Joseph the second in memory of his mother, Theresia. And it was the place where you had the intelligentsia of Europe, the best doctors, the best musician, artists, etc., composers. And they put them there, and highly decorated war veterans. They felt like, well, we put them in one place and nobody will complain about that. It was the antechamber uh, to Auschwitz. Keep them there a while and then we'll transport them. But many people died there, over 30,000 of 140 died there of malnutrition, disease, many old people were there, and two-thirds would be shipped out to the killing centers like It was actually a transit camp, but you transit. stayed there. You stayed right. there. But eventually they started to build gas chambers there too, 
Mm -hmm. But they were incomplete because Eichmann, who was in charge of the whole Jewish question, the final solution, he wanted every Jew to be killed. And he ordered also gas chambers to be built in Terrazin. Mm. And I saw him there. Mm. You saw him? Yes. I mean, I knew what he was he there. I mean, you couldn't really look into his eyes, but I know he was there because I met people afterwards who mm. even ate lunch with him. None, uh, one was a telephone operator on the other side, the, the, you know, the Christian side. Mm. He did come, yes. You were seven years old when you came, you little girl still. Yes, a little girl. And you actually were sick also because there was malnutrition, it was yeah. bad living conditions, everything Very was bad. Very crowded. And you were, you were actually in, uh, you were sick for some time. Well, I became sick there. Mm -hmm. There was a girl in our compound, I mean, her father was also disabled, war veteran, and we were told, don't go near her, don't play with her, she's sick and it's very catching. But she got a little bit more food, another piece of bread, maybe very diluted milk, which I never had. And I prayed to God, I said, I want to have what she has. Mm. Unfortunately, it came true. Uh, I had tuberculosis of both of my lungs, very sick. And I carried that to America. I felt a little better after the war, but it broke out very severely. Uh, the first few months I was in New York where I settled. Mm. And it took a lot of uh, new uh, medicines that were just discovered at that mm. time, really just to save my life, like the drug streptomycin, which got the Nobel Prize, but not to the person who actually invented mm. it. Mm. The professor got and it. You wrote about him. We should yes. go back to your stay in the U.S. afterwards, but let's let's stay a little bit in Tennessee. Certainly. Yes, uh, because you actually saw your parents, uh, and uh, there was quite moving because your parents were very eager to make make you have a childhood the way they could. On your birthdays, you had yes. three birthday gifts in yes. Tennessee. Why don't you tell us what did well, your parents make for you these one years? birthday was a tiny cake, I mean the size of a child's hand, made out of a crushed potato with just a hint of sugar. Because we didn't get much and even the potato was, they were like diamonds for us. Mm. Another one was, the last one birthday was a poem my mother wrote for me. She was a very good writer and she, a little piece of paper on one side was still good and that was one birthday, this poem. Another one was a new outfit for my doll, which was made out of rags. Mm. Oh, they yeah. tried to make the days different. Well, they tried with all their heart. Mm. You made friends also in Teresin. Yes, I did. But not all of them survived. No. I had a very good friend. We shared the bunk beds. We were on the top tier. And this other family was from Berlin. They had a daughter by the name of Ruth. And Ruth was uh, two months older than I. She had the same doll. But Ruth's father was also, he walked with the limp, also a disabled war veteran. But there was a sel main selection at the end. All the war veterans had to go for this selection to the camp. Home and dad there. And, um, my father and he went the same time because the name was A, Auerbach and Abraham, but her father was half Jewish and the mother totally, but Ruth, who actually would be Jewish, when the mother's Jewish, she's Jewish, the child is Jewish, but she was brought up as a devout Christian. And they went for the selection and my father told him, did you go to the lady with the typewriter? She put a red circle around her name. Mm -hmm. And he said, no. Mm -hmm. And then a few weeks later, they went to Auschwitz, the whole mm. family killed. Mm. I never forgot her. Mm. I still light candles on her birthday, October 21. I visited her house. There were these memory stones on the, on, on, in the cement, the Stolpersteine. Mm. And um, I never forgot her. Mm. You were also in Terracine when the International Red Crumbs Cross came to ex inspect. Yes. And they really made a posh facade to make everything look very nice. Yes. Do you have any memories of oh, that? Yeah. Or I remember it very well. 
they selected certain people who still look good, especially children, to show them how they play. They gave them some sardine sandwiches, which they ate up so quickly. I have a friend that they selected her, they didn't select me. Anyway, uh, I was always interested. They made a film at that time. I said, Mommy, I want to go when they do a film. I want to be a movie star. And my mother said, you don't go anywhere. You always lay low. Don't ever volunteer for anything. So they put up signs to school, to playground, and there was a gazebo where uh, music was being played. We had a lot of very famous musicians, and they made a film about that. And the report that they gave was, everything is fine. Uh, the children have games, they get sardine sandwiches. In fact, they had to say, Uncle Ram, Ram was our last commandant, oh, we're sick of them, uh, we want to play. I mean, they ate them up so quickly, they had to replenish them. And, um, and that was a very uh, serious situation. The International Red Cross went away, and a few weeks later, almost the, uh, the whole camp was emptied and sent to Auschwitz to be mm. killed. Mm. There was almost nobody left. It was actually a very famous event. Yes. And you also, uh, you were, uh, remember the op opera that was made, the children's opera. Well, it was made uh, actually before this Kraza who wrote it, had the premiere, I believe, in an orphanage in Prague, but he brought it into the camp, maybe out of memory, I'm not sure. And some children did pr uh, play this uh, opera, and it was shown to the, uh, to the International Red Cross inspection. Uh, I didn't understand it, and I was not part of it, but I do remember it, because it was all in Czech. The Czech children had it a little bit better, with more, a little under, uh, you know, not really educated, but they did it in secret and they had a very good um, pro teacher, Friedel Digger Brandeis, who was uh, an artist herself. She was killed as well. But the German children had almost nothing. Mm. You said the Czech children, I mean, in yeah. the camp, the language you spoke, you couldn't check. No, I could count up to 10, which I still can. Awesome desert, up to 10. Mm -hmm. Mm. Why? A few words. Mm. I rem remember those, but mm. I couldn't speak Czech. How many nationalities did you get to know in the camp? Well, eventually, by the way, the Danes came, mm -hmm. which was a separate situation because the king stood up. Don't take my subjects. They did come, uh, but I believe none of them were sent to Auschwitz. They came maybe a year later and more than that. And none of them, as far as I know, were killed in, in Auschwitz, maybe before they were sent to Terrazin. We had people from Holland. I had family. And uh, they were, went from Germany to Holland. They were taken in and Westerbork, and then they came to us. And various other countries came. But mainly it was either German or Czech, mainly Czech. Mm which was nearby, I mean, they could just take them, mm -hmm. and it was not far. I mean, Terezin is 60 kilometers north of Prague. Mm. What did your parents tell you? Did they give you hope? Were they optimistic? Did they think they would survive and the war would end? Well, you know, you had these talks, that they called them latrine talks, mm -hmm. and somebody would say, oh, uh, the uh, allies are at the door and we'll be free. And then another one would exaggerate, oh, they're here already. And that, those were called latrine talks. They were just, you know, one making more of it than, uh, than what it really was. But because we had no uh, uh, contact with the outside world, maybe some Czechs had a little bit more. They could, you know, clandestinely, we did not. But I remember one terrible day, we were rounded up, it was a count out. They knew exactly how many people were there. And they put us into this uh, field, with, surrounded with hills, and uh, the guards were uh, pointing guns at us. They didn't shoot, it was raining, and our feet sunk in the mud. And at the end of the day, they, uh, these, uh, they were beating the people, of course, no food all day, no bathroom, nothing, nothing. 
and they uh, said, everybody has to go back. I mean, they did count, but they knew exactly how many people there. Germans are very good in bookkeeping. That's one thing they're good at, among other things, of course. Good things, too. I will not say they're all bad. And they said, men, women, and children separate. And we didn't want to leave each other, so we held on to each other. And my mother already gave up with everything. She said, we're going to die here. We're going to die here. So my father, don't worry. You'll ride in the car again one day. Mm -hmm. But that was a big deal when he proposed to my mother. He came in a shiny car, and she said, yes, right. He had a car. That was a big deal. So <laughs> uh, he gave us hope. My mother was a little bit more uneasy. Mm -hmm. Your father, the war veteran, he gave you hope in the he Second did World give us War. Hope. In the Second World War. Yes, in the Second World War, mm -hmm. and of course, I felt as long as I have my parents, mm -hmm. they will take care of me. And I was lucky enough mm -hmm. to keep my parents. You were lucky. Yes, yes. But just plain luck. Mm -hmm. When did you understand that peace had come, that the war was over? How did you? Remember that, you were, you were in the camp in May 1945. Yeah, well, right, I mean, it, it, it came very suddenly, actually. A few days before, you saw some uh, piece, burnt pieces of paper from the, you know, from the papers. We had the, um, the information on these things. Um, and it was very strange that this was happening, and then you heard noises of the cars mm -hmm. moving out. I mean, we were surrounded by these brick walls, barbed wire, and wooden fences. So here, by this time, I'm 10 years old, and I'm a real ghetto child by this time. Uh, I was a pretty, uh, you know, a pretty active little girl, and um, ghetto-wise, and I jump up on one of these wooden fences to see what is going on. And as I did, there was a big explosion. I thought my head had popped off. And they were throwing in hand grenades, and that was about May 8th. And I ran to my parents, and many people, some people died on that day too, when they were throwing in these hand grenades. They wanted to kill every single one yet. We found a dark cellar, somebody had a little a tiny candle in this darkness. And I took one thing with me, a prayer book my father found in the garbage. And it belonged to a man from Nuremberg, a former soldier. It was like a soldier's prayer book, small. And probably that person didn't uh, want to take it when he was sent to Auschwitz. He didn't know where he was going. Oh, he lost faith in God. But I still have that prayer book. And I never lost faith in God, never. I was brought up modern Orthodox, and um, my mother would always sit with me when I said my prayers. And then somebody walked up and he said, we are free, the Russians are here. But it wasn't real jubilation. We knew already by then almost nobody would come back, but still we had hope, because at the end, Eichmann ordered the people who were not free yet, because the um, Auschwitz was liberated in January 27th, 1945, and we were still in grave danger in May. So he sent all these death marches to our camp. They were in terrible condition, and they told us, don't you know what happened? They kept it from us. Who told you this? who told us, the, the people from the death marches, mm. who came from Bergen, Bells, and So they came the death marches to, to Teresina. Yeah, they, they moved they them were around. The, the witnesses. Yeah, they were the witnesses, mm. right. Mm. Mm. They even had a special camp in uh, Auschwitz, the uh, Teresin family camp, and that mm. had the right back to us. Oh, it's nice here, come. And in a few days, whatever, mm. they liquidated that whole camp and to the gas chamber. Mm. But then, actually, peace and the war ended in Teresin for you. We had a tremendous typhus epidemic at that time, especially from these people on death mud, they were deathly sick, and uh, it was quarantine. Even I read about it in the New York Times, and we could not leave right away. No, no, no. And then a bus came and picked up the few survivors. Mm. But you were 
all the time together with your mother and father? Uh, well, I was in, in the hospital, so-called hospital yeah. with scarlet fever, epidemic of scarlet fever. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't see them for maybe four months. That was in, in 1945? It, when, yeah, no, it was in 42 when mm. I arrived yeah, yeah, in right. the camp. Mm. And uh, I, I was, we were really scared that uh, they would take our parents away. And there were two children in every bed. Everybody had lice and uh, boils on their body and none of us were supposed to be uh, to stay alive, but I did. Mm. I'm tough. Mm. You are here. I'm here. But then in May 45. Yes. Then you were saved. And what happened to you then uh, after you it took some time in the camp? But where did you go? Well, a bus came from Stuttgart to pick up the few survivors. Mm -hmm. And first they put us in a displaced persons camp, maybe mm -hmm. a week or two. And then we made our way back to, to Jebenhausen or the to Jebenhausen, mm -hmm. hoping that my grandmother would be standing at the door. Of course, she had died years already before that. The house they took away at that time when we were deported, when my grandmother actually was deported. And the people living in the house from every room, but they made one room empty for us and we didn't stay very long. We went to the bigger city and when President Truman opened the doors for us, in 1945, we went on the second displaced persons boat, the Marine Perch, and landed in New York City. When was this in New York City? In May, May of 1946, uh, six, excuse me. 46, yeah. But you did have family also in New York, didn't you? Yeah, my mother had a brother um, whose wife actually had um, a relative, an uncle, who was a butcher, and he did very well, and he got them out in time. And we went to them. It was crowded in the apartment, and my f parents then had to get a job. So the soldiers were all coming back. They needed jobs too. So my parents got a job in the, in the villa, in a very rich home. My mother became the cook, and the maid, and my father, the butler. Hmm. And where did you stay? Well, I was, uh, well, I got uh, sick again, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I had a very bad cough, and the lady said, we have to take her to the doctor, and he said immediately to the hospital. It was a charity hospital uh, on a ward, and there was only one day a week they could see us, and Sunday, and the lady said, well, I need you to work for me on Sunday. So my mother said, look, I'm allowed only a few hours on Sunday. I want to see my child. And they got fired. Mm. Again, nothing. Mm. But then they got a new job. Well, they got a job eventually. But now you were into a proper hospital and so that it could really help you because you had well, to there was tuberculosis from the there was no. Um, th there was no cure in those days. Either mm. you rested, you stayed in bed, total bed rest, you know, there was no drug at that time. You lived or you died. And then I was in bed for two years, nothing ha was happening. My parents had been taking her out. And by that time they had an apartment in Brooklyn, third floor up, and I became really extremely ill with hemorrhaging and I mean, I couldn't even sit up in bed. And uh, we took the doctor that originally um, took me, you know, in the hospital, and he didn't want anything to do with me anymore. I guess he saw this girl's gonna die. I don't want her on my hands. So we found another doctor who started uh, to treat me with this new drug, experimental in those days, and it helped me greatly save my life. The streptomycin. Streptomycin. Which also saved uh, tuberculosis patients in this country. It was yeah. a marvel that it It was a, a miracle drug at that mm. time, but some people lost their hearing. Mm -hmm. I mean, every drug has an effect. Thank God I did not. Mm -hmm. and but yeah. that means that you didn't actually, you couldn't attend school because you were a big no. girl at that time. Yeah. So you started to well, read at the hospital and write well, poems. Yeah. Well, the poems came later. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we had some bedside instruction. But we were all so sick that and it was very difficult. We had a teacher, but it was not real school. And when I was at home, the uh, Board of Health said she can't go to school. She's still uh, not well. 
and they did uh, get a teacher for me, a, a fairly older lady, and she couldn't walk the three stairs. So they gave me the books, and I started to teach myself, and started to write. Mm. And somebody gave me piano lessons. We had no lady living with us, a, sort of a sub-boarder, and her daughter, I uh, was a pianist and she gave lessons and she gave me free lessons. And I took that for about a year and a half uh, before I got interested in science. Mm -hmm. But then you st when did you start to write? Uh, I wanted to ask you to read a poem to us because you started, Thank you. you're a writer actually. You're well, it's a uh, hobby. Inge Aubach has written several books. Six. Uh, six books. And you have read a poem to me before. Could you yes. could we ask you to read yes, a poem to I us? Yes, I would be very happy to. Yes, I think you and have a book here, but you need some glasses. Yes. Well, I need glasses. Yes, I, I've been wearing glasses since I'm three years old, and I hate them, but I need them to read. We all do. We need all glasses. Do. That's okay. Well, one day I was sitting at my kitchen table, and I always wanted to find a picture of my girlfriend Ruth. Somebody must have a picture. And because uh, the, her grandmother never was sent to the camp, so she must have had Christian uh, relatives. And I put in the uh, Tagesspiegel, a, a newspaper in Germany online, and a paper, uh, newspaper in Berlin. She came from Berlin, that I'm looking for a picture. And somehow one person had a picture when she was maybe three years old, I met when she was eight, and I, it, it just um, touched me so to see that picture. I didn't recognize her on the picture. She, she was very young there. And I said, how did she feel when she walked with her mother into the gas chamber? Because the mothers walked with the children and the men were separate. And this came to mind Hold me tight, it's called. Come with me, my child, hold my hand. Be calm, my child, do not try to understand. Don't be afraid, my child, walk with pride. You know, your mother is here at your side. A mother is giving hope when there is no hope left. Hold me tight, day has turned to night. Soon we'll see the light. No, no, don't look at the chimneys. See the blue sky. My arm is around to protect you. Don't cry. Come close. Let the blows fall on me. There'll be a day when again we'll be free. There's still hope when there's nothing. Hold me tight. Day has turned to night. Soon we'll see the light. Give all your belongings to them. Quickly undress. One day soon, we will again have happiness. Sleep, my child. I have no more to give. Oh, God. Oh, God. We are not going to live. Hold me tight. Day has turned to night. Hold me told me the other day that actually because you had been so much to hospitals, you wanted to be a doctor. Yes. So you definitely went, well, you managed, I mean, you caught up the schools you lost, the years you lost, you caught I up. I lost you eight years. Yes, you, many years, but you yeah. caught up and you had your college education and university education yes. and you ended up as a chemist, but you actually wanted to be a doctor. I did. Because you'd seen so many doctors. Right. And when I first, I went my first time back to Europe, it was 1966. And I went to Terrace and I never told my parents I'm going there. The Russians were still there. You needed special papers, some kind of a visa to spend three days in Czech Republic. Today it's Czech Republic. And I went into the crematory, the former crematory, and I said to myself, Yes, I've worked many years now, but I'm a little bit older. By that time, I was about 32. I have to do something more with my life. I was, you know, I was so lucky to keep my life, and I must do something. 
do now what you have dreamt, dreamt about. You want to be a doctor? Then do it. So I never tried in America. I thought they wouldn't take me uh, with my history of this sickness. So I tried on the lark, really, to Heidelberg. They have really one at one time the best medical school in the whole world. And they accepted me. And I finally went. But they had to have my credits evaluated because in Germany you have the four physicum. It's medicine takes six years. In our country it takes eight. Be a, to have a bachelor's and then you go to med school for four years. Then comes your training. And I had to go to Stuttgart to have my credits evaluated. I had my acceptance. And she, the secretary looks at me, ah, sie sind eine Vertriebene. You're a displaced person. And it just hit me. I said, yes, but I was accepted. Well, why did you come back here? And I said, oh my God, this is the welcome I get. And then I went to my rented room, a little village away, Wiebling it was called. And it was May 1st, it was the summer semester. And I heard singing in, on the streets. And I opened the window and they were singing Nazi songs. Kameraden und Genossen marschieren auch in unseren Reihen mit. I said, oh my God, starting up all over again. And next day I went to the university and I said, I can't stay here. Here's my entrance, here you can have it. But I had some new friends over there, a professor whom I became friends with from the medical school. I said, I did this. He said, no, 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 you're going to stay here. I'm going to, you know, turn this whole thing around. I called my mother. And my mother said, I told you not to go. Come <laughs> home immediately. So you see, you have to listen to your mother. And you were 32 years old. And yeah. I was 32, mm -hmm. yes. And I gave it up. I came back and uh, to my job. I worked 38 years in research and clinical work. Mm. And I'm happily retired now. Mm. And I spent my time lecturing all over the world. And my books are in nine languages. And I'm working on another one right now. In fact, I've written songs too. And one of them will be sung by a children's choir, very diverse group. And the United Nations, the main hall on January 27th, International Holocaust Day, and I'll be speaking, they gave me about eight minutes. Well, you can say a lot in eight minutes. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy about that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to include something here since we're coming probably to the end. I live in a very diverse neighborhood. Uh, Queens is the most diverse place in the whole country, in the United yeah. States. In Galbo lives in Queens. One of yes, those. in Queens. You know, you have Manhattan, you have the Bronx, Brooklyn, Staten Island, which is called Richmond, and Queens is the most diverse. You have everything there. I live in a row house. One side lives a very devout Muslim family from Bangladesh, which was at one time India, then it was changed into Pakistan and Bangladesh. The other side, my walls are right, you know, same wall. A uh, Hindu family, from Guyana, at one time was British Guyana, also very religious, and then Christian house. And you have the four basic religions living side by side. And that would be my dream for the world. Mm. We can live together. We have to try. You live in the multicultural New York City. Yes. But tell me, because we're closing in soon, and yes. we maybe should ask the audience if yes. they have questions. But right. why, because you were a busy lady working, um, why did you start to tell, to travel around and tell your story? Why did you, what, what happened? Yeah, well, in 1981, there was the first world gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors in Jerusalem. And I wrote a poem, and I found somebody to set it to music, we shall never forget. It's called, uh, I met the lady in the ladies' dressing room in my hospital, and she was talking, she sings here, she sings there. I said, do you write music? Oh yeah, sure, I can write music. And she had the song within about one day, and it became the only original song uh, sung in Jerusalem for that meeting, we shall never forget. 
And then I decided, I always wanted to write my life story. And um, then I started to write this, uh, first some songs, some more songs, and then the book came out. And then I met uh, one person at a meeting. And he is on the picture in, from Auschwitz that was actually posed, the picture where you see children behind barbed wire. It's a very famous picture. Oh yeah, the twins the in twi France. Well, not only twins, other people too. But he happened to have been a twin um, experiment by Mengele. And he told me, Inga, we are the remnants. I'm a boy, you're a girl. Please come with me. We must tell our stories. You must. I said, well, I have a job. I work weekends. I uh, work very hard. Well, whenever you can, come with me. And I did start to come with him. And since then, I mean, I've been speaking mm. all over the world. Mm. What, when you meet young people, school pupils yes. or students, what is your message? The message for me is, Get to know other people. Don't be prejudgmental. Have a voice. You have a choice in life uh, to either follow bad people or good. Uh, I'm also asked many times about forgiveness. Do I forgive? I come back to Germany, so forth. Now, my idea of forgiveness, I know in the Christian faith, you have to forgive because Jesus died for all sins. In the Jewish faith, a little different. When you hurt somebody, that person whom you hurt has to ask, uh, well, the person who does the hurting has to ask the people, person whom he hurt or she hurt for forgiveness three times. And if it doesn't, that person doesn't say, well, there's no forgiveness. But let's say somebody kills somebody, like, Mengele, like all these terrible people, and the person is no more all around. What do you do? There's no forgiveness. But I believe in reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I, for instance, there are many people whom I'm friends with who were born after all this happened, or who were children during that time. I still have friends who were good to me. And I remember going to Auschwitz a few years ago. It's part one is the uh, Auschwitz I, two is Birkenau, it's pretty far away, you walk two kilometers. And I had heard German spoken there. I said, oh my God, German in this place. So I went to them and uh, I told them I was born in Germany, I spoke German to them. And um, they, you know, I said, I was not here, I was in another camp, but I lost people in this place. And the first thing we did, these were young people, maybe seven, eight, a whole family and friends, we embraced. We embraced. And that is my idea of coming to a conclusion with this problem, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I can't be friends with them again. But the ones who were the actual killers, I cannot forgive. Mm -hmm. I cannot. You often go, you often been back to Germany, your own yes. first country. Actually, when you came here, you had stayed in your old yes, house it was in Kippenheim. Yes, it was amazing. I, um, I, good friends with the people who own my house, our house, and they said, how would you like to s sleep in, a, in, in your house? And I said, oh, that would be fantastic because I haven't slept in that house since I'm four years old. In Kippenheim. And in Kippenheim, and even the German paper, it's called Bild. It's, it's a pretty famous newspaper. They oh, came. we know it. We know the Bild side. Bild. Yeah. yeah, so <laughs> they had a whole article about that. They came there. Uh, when I had a little time, it was hard to do mm. it. And they were very kind to me. And uh, we have a very good friendship. I mean, they had nothing to do with it. It was actually the parents of the people who own it now who bought the house. And... Um, when you meet the German, your own former home country, I mean... Well, look, I could become a citizen again of Germany. I'm born there. They took away my citizenship. I was nobody. Today, I'm somebody. I have a country. I have a voice. Mm. 
And I'm proud to be an American citizen. Yes, that's my home now. Mm -hmm. They brought me back to good health. They, they, they gave me schooling. Um, mm -hmm. I don't need right now any other citizenship. Maybe one day I'll do it, but not now. No. 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 I'm grateful to America. I met Elvis some years ago, and uh, you know he was in France. Yes. And uh, I asked him about citizenship, and he said, oh, I could never ever, because what happened in the US, they gave me a passport, my first passport. Yeah. So that is you. It's true. But Inga Obama, should we ask if the audience have any questions yes, or comments, course. and then we're coming to an end. Right. I think we have Kari and yeah. Nina here, uh, Nina Vigvagstein right. and Kari Amdam. Yeah. Anybody, um, you will have to, you could have the question in Norwegian, and I can try to translate, but please, Mention your, uh, take your name. Anybody? And remember, no question is a stupid question. It's stupid not to ask because this opportunity is not going to come too many more times. Sure. Then you have to read it in books, to see movies, and you say, well, maybe they lied, or, you know, and you have so also uh, the uh, Holocaust deniers coming up today. Yes, please. There was one hand in the middle. You have to take the hand again, please. Hello, my name is Ellen Holm Stenersen. Uh, I just wonder if you remember two sisters called Evie and Dorley. I don't remember the family name. <laughs> and they were uh, living, one of them, with my husband's family and uh, the other with the neighbors. And uh, then the, when the, the Germans came to Norway, their parents wanted them back. They were from Czechia. And, um, well, they lived in Theresienstadt. Their parents died, but they are now living in, in Israel. Could you Do you remember them? Could you repeat Evi, the names? The Evi and Dorle. And I don't, I was stupid enough to, there was something on B, I was stupid enough not to check before I went <laughs> from home. Well, anyway, I, no, I didn't know them. No. No, I mean, we were 15,000 children. Yeah. Oh, that almost much. <laughs> yes, okay. there were many children, <laughs> and uh, I did not. I, and I mainly was with the German children. Anybody else? Hello, my name Hello. is Nina Rigo. Thank you so much for your témoignage. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have one question. Um, when you talked about your life in your little village when you were <coughs> small, uh, you were saying the Jews were living a little bit apart, uh, or, s yeah. Wall to wall, I mean, the houses were next to each other, to each but other. social life social was a little life. bit separate. Yes, and then you had one way of putting it, maybe I was wrong, but I was just asking you what you meant by that. You said the Jews and the other, the Christians, were there a distinction between Jews and Christians? Was there a, a question of religion? Well, the Nazis made it such. Pardon? The Nazis made it, made the, the distinction. Nazis, they are the others. Those are the others. others. Those are the so other, others, Christians, meaning Jews. I see. Not Christians. Yeah, okay. We were the others. The Jews were the others. Yes. But they were talking about Christians and Jews. So they were talking about the religion? Well, they said we are a race, which we are not. Okay. And I mean, they're black Jews, the Indian Jews, I've seen all of them. Yeah. But they made us a race, which we are uh -huh. not. We are religion. See. And become in all colors and all ethnic, uh, all different sizes. Okay, thank you for making it so clear. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Hello, my name is Easy Miller. My name is Easy Miller. I can also count in Czech to ten, like you. My parents were Czech, and both of them were in Theresienstadt, yes. like you. They survived, that's why I'm here. Uh, I think all you told us is agreement with what my parents told me during their life. 
But I've got a question to you. And uh, we have had the past, but now what have you learned from this? And you have made some interesting comments. How, what shall we do in the future? And my question to you is, why uh, so many number of people, Jewish people living in Europe, are trying to emigrate to Israel because they feel uncomfortable in Europe in these times. Yeah. Can you make some comments on this anti-Semitism which still prevails in a society after so many years of the Second World? Well, one of the reasons I am here now is because you read in the newspapers, see on CNN and other channels, things are happening now dangerous things, this new right-wing party coming up, and uh, with the immigrants coming, uh, these people who are coming from other countries, and again, they include the Jews, anti-Semitism. That bothers me tremendously. And when I speak to students, I tell them, you have to be very careful, you have choices in life. You don't have to join and run with these people. Think about it, what you're doing. Think what happened during World War II that brought about the death of 50 million people, all these soldiers and, and the other innocent people. And I hope they're listening. Yes, there are danger signs. I just, I have a filmmaker who made a very nice film about me, about Crystal Knight many years ago. He was in Germany, he was actually born in Israel. He lived in Germany for about 20 years, and he said, I feel very uncomfortable here. And he came back to America, where he lives now. It, it's a dangerous situation. Very dangerous. And you know, it isn't now that the country is not prosperous. There are plenty of jobs there. They have plenty of money. The economy is good. At that time, when Hitler got to power, you know, the economy was very bad. There was a world depression, and he promised them everything. But today, you have a great economy. Yes, it is a problem with the people coming in from other countries. I feel something about that. When you are guests of a country, you have to um, be, uh, you know, assimilated somehow into that, uh, you know, country, abide by the laws. And you, I mean, you're a guest in that country, and it's very important that we assimilated. I mean, thousand years we're living there, and everybody always says, oh, the German Jews were more German than the Jews. And I tell you, when my first book came out, my father was still alive. He lived to see it. I said, Dad, you're into my book. Really? What, what did you use? Your soldier picture. He said, that's good. We assimilated. You can do in your home whatever you want. Where I live, they have the picture of the Kaaba, you know, the holy place for the Muslims. And the Hindus have their prayer room and their uh, whatever religious things they do. You can do what you want, but we're all Americans. We speak the language. I get very angry when people, like in America, they talk to me in Spanish. I answer them in, in, in German. <laughs> then they look at me, what is she saying? Well, I had to learn it too. You have to abide by the law. And that's, you know, you can't make another country do whatever was back home. If it was so good, why didn't you stay there then? Mm. Yeah? But I'm open to have people come in, certainly. They're running, some of them are running for their lives. Maybe also to have a better life, that's fine. But abide by the laws. Mm. One last question and then I think we are closing in. No, then I'll ask you a question. Oh, sure. What about your parents? They, they, they really, they stayed. They never ever wanted to go back to Germany. They no. settled down in the U.S.? No, they did go back to Germany. Yeah. But we had... I mean, to settle down in Germany, they did not? No? No, no. we didn't want that. No. Although it was hard for my father. Sometimes he said, oh, I should have stayed in Germany. I mean, he learned the language, not too good. But we had a German um, household. We spoke German at home. That's why after 70, more than 70 years in America, 
I still f speak German, and I can give a lecture in German. My friends cannot. We had German food. In fact, for my birthday, my mother would say, what do you want for your birthday, your special dish? Sauerbraten, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and Spätzle. Spätzle. Mm. And how old were your parents? How, how, how long did they live? Well, my father was uh, almost 89, mm. and my mother uh, 90 and a half. Mm. Long life. Yeah. Well, I hope to make it longer. Mm. I hope to make it to 120. Well, you're only 34 years old. Uh, exactly. Yes. I think we should just thank you so much, Ingalva, for thank coming you. here and uh, enlightening much. us on a Saturday afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I have, I have just one last word to say. Um, if you can, can you all stand up and hold hands, the ones who can, and say shalom. It means peace, hello, and goodbye. We want to live in peace together. That is my wish. My wish. One, two, three. Shalom. shalom. Louder. I got to hear it in Jamaica. <laughs> One, two, three. Shalom. I wish you a, a good life and happy holidays. It's right around the corner. And be happy and healthy. Very important. Thank you. Thank you.